let's just first go based off of the return to learn plan that you guys have already sent out mm -hmm. to all of your parents and staff. Uh, that came back on July 8th. What was kind of built into that plan to kind of ensure safety all the while tying in virtual learning and in-class learning, in-person learning? Sure. So our return to learn plan, uh, much like most people's, sort of provides for three contingencies. The number one is the on-site learning plan. Number two would be a potential hybrid learning plan. And number three would be the complete online learning plan. Obviously, with the governor's announcement last week on Friday, the good news is that's what we were all hoping for. We, we want to be back in the classroom. Our teachers want to be back in the classroom. We've surveyed our teachers. I do think that that's one thing that separates us from a lot of other um, uh, stories I've seen is that a lot of teachers are, are apprehensive to go back into the classroom and a lot don't even want to go back in the classroom. Obviously, some of our teachers have some apprehension, but all of our teachers really want to get back in the classroom and get back to teaching. So with the governor's guidance from last week, proclamation, it clearly um, dictates to us that we will be open at the end of August, and we're anxious for that opportunity, clearly knowing that there will be a lot of mitigation efforts on our behalf and our teachers and our families, and we hope that we're able to uh, implement those, and those will be fluid over the next several weeks and probably throughout the school year. It might be the situation where where one week it's, uh, it's one set of mitigation practices and the next week we have to step those up and then maybe a month later we're able to pull some of those back. It just kind of depends on how things move. We are always in communication with Siouxland District Health because we want their guidance on, on a lot of these issues as well. So we appreciate their help and their support and their guidance through this. Yeah, and I know you guys are of a private uh, sector opposed to the Sioux City Community School District, Correct. but I, I did attend their school board meeting on Monday, and they were talking about a li a li some of the changes that they'll be making based off the governor's yes. decision. And a lot of it was, a big question was surrounding on the issue of masks. And right. Should they should be mandatory the full time, or if they should be, you know, there should be a little flexibility there. And if you're speaking to maybe somebody in kindergarten where it's easier to read, your, your lips uh, as a teacher. So for you guys, what are you specifically doing in regards to masks? Are you gonna be handing out masks to students? Are masks gonna be mandatory full time? Just kind of tie in the, the whole argument for Sure. Masks. First of all, we will have masks available to students and to staff who might forget theirs at home, who might um, you know, drop it in their lunch at, at lunchtime or drop it on the floor and have it stepped on. So we will have additional masks available to all students and to faculty. Uh, throughout the days just as, as common practice for those who might run into problems. As far as where we s currently stand with masks, everything is still up in the air. Um, if, if school were to start today, I can tell you that we probably would be leaning towards the usage of more masks throughout the day and, and throughout time. Certainly, um, younger students, it's a lot harder for them. We do have students that would have some health concerns, maybe some skin irritations, those kinds of things. We will work around with them. But to be honest with you, the mask determination will probably be an 11th hour decision. It'll be something that will say, where are we as a society? Where are we as a county? Where are we as a community? And where does Siouxland District Health think that we lie with that? Um, it, but again, if it was today, we probably would be leaning towards more usage of mask, masks throughout the day. Again, it might be something where as students come into the school building and they leave the school building and they're in the halls, masks you know, might be more pertinent when, when they're around more students as opposed to when they're in their own cohort, when they're in their own school classroom, when their own school space, um, we might have the flexibility of, of releasing some of that uh, mandate, so. And have parents, staff, or, or even students approached you at all uh, in, in regards to them being concerned that, you know, if we don't go to school with masks on, that I, I, I would rather be, say, a, a, an online student or an online teacher or vice versa. I don't want my kid wearing a mask in school because I don't think they should. I think without a doubt the mask debate is alive and well, and, and I hear about it often from parents and from, from faculty and staff. And to, be, and to your point, it may be a situation where each building looks a little bit different. We might have a building that has four or five faculty and staff members who feel more comfortable in a mask and for their students to be in a mask. And so that building might be open with, with mask usage or one of our other buildings might have less mask usage. It might be something where one of our teachers who has an underlying health concern or maybe their spouse does, maybe that classroom all day long, any student that walks into that classroom is in a mask, but they might not be in a mask um, in another classroom. So we totally view this as being a very fluid situation. 
very malleable and adapting with with kind of what's going on in the circumstances. So it's it's definitely on everybody's mind for sure. And the return to learn plan that you guys have already sent out, are you going to be making changes as the school year starts to approach to it? Was this kind of like a rough draft in a way? Yeah, this was kind of the, the plan to say, well, if we come back on site, you know, here's some things we're going to be looking at. If we go to a hybrid model, here's things we'll look at. And if we go to online, here's things we'll be doing. But we are also working on an additional plan right now, actually, the administrators and myself, where we're looking at what those mitigation efforts will exactly look like in terms of six feet uh, social distancing, hopefully in as many classrooms as we can make happen. Um, making teachers maybe move from classroom to classroom, particularly with the preschool through eighth grade classrooms, that students won't move out of their classroom to go to a music class or to go to art class. The music teacher in the art class room teachers will come into the classroom so that those elementary students don't have to move and that their, their germs and their, their um, experiences are sort of contained to their workspace. At the high school, that's obviously more difficult. Students will move from class to class. We are considering what other uh, mitigation efforts we might utilize. For example, one thing we're, we're talking about is um, alphabetizing uh, seating charts for our students so that when a student goes into a classroom, they always go to the same desk day after day after day after day, but then they're also alphabetized so that if they do come in contact and have exposure with other students, even if it's maybe not the same student they've been sitting by all day long, there's a better chance that there'll be less students that will be um, involved with that contact tracing that we'll have to do through Siouxland District Health. And um, to further my point on um, going to that meeting on Monday, are you guys looking at other school districts and seeing what they're doing and trying to also mirror what you guys want to do with them? Or are you guys trying to be kind of a separate entity? How, how are you guys moving forward? For certain, we're trying to keep our eye on all the research, the things that CDC is telling us, that the Iowa Department of Ed, that the Siouxland District Health, we're also doing research online. We're looking and seeing what's working in Europe, what's not working in Europe. We know that their schools, a lot of their schools have reopened and trying to see what their efforts look like. Unfortunately, the United States is not in the same place with the pandemic as Europe is at this time. Who knows where we'll be in six weeks. But I think for sure best practice is to look and to consider any and all options. Certainly I've had parents you know, email with ideas and suggestions as well. We're looking at anything and everything we can that we think will keep our students and our families safe. Um, so we are for sure researching and, and doing anything and everything we can to try to say, oh, is that something we've considered? How might that work for us? Or how, how would that not work for our families? Or how would that work maybe with our younger grades but not with our older grades? So we're, we're exploring all options for sure. What decisions have already been made in that plan? And uh when can parents maybe expect more information to come out uh, or, or to change on that plan? So obviously the first thing is that we will be in session at the end of August. That's the first thing about the plan that's for sure been defined and, and, and articulated. I, I expect that we're gonna have more answers by uh, Monday, August 3rd. That's kind of our target date. That gives us three weeks until school starts for families to make plans. It's also still a couple weeks down the road for us to see what the climate is like, to see what the pandemic is doing um, in Woodbury County and in, in Union County and in Dakota County as well. So I, I really believe that we will be producing more information for our families on Monday, August 3rd. That's our target date for that. And uh, school starts on what day? Our freshmen, our ninth graders start on Monday, August 24th. Everybody else starts on Tuesday, August 25th. All right, great. And. Uh... With uh, the, the plan that I saw, the hybrid learning plan, uh, you were separating it based off the alphabet, like you were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, but like A through M and then N through Z are gonna go on different days. Uh, how did you kind of come up with that plan? <laughs> the hybrid plan has been the messiest plan of all of them. I do believe that there will be some hybrid teaching this year and what hybrid might also mean, besides what's in the plan, which I will address here in a minute, but what that also might mean is that there might be two or three kids in a, in a third grade classroom that one kid has been tested positive for COVID and there are two other kids that have come in um, contact um, with that child. And so those three students might be sent home for, for two weeks or for three weeks for that quarantine period and everything else. And so those three students will still need to be educated during those two to three weeks they're home. So the hybrid will also mean for us 
uh, um, in-person teaching for those other kids in the class, but also teaching for those three students at home, especially once they feel well enough to, to take on that homework. And so that, there is a hybrid there as well, where there will be kids actually in the class and kids that'll be at home possibly sick or in quarantine from having exposure. So that's, that's one hybrid portion that I'm sure we'll see some this year. The hybrid portion we have in our, in our plan is really just something that we feel like is the best scenario for that kind of situation, which allows us to have ample cleaning after every day before the next crop of students come in the next day. And it also allows for us to uh, mitigate the chances of, of exposure and of transmission of the COVID. So how did we come up with that plan? Um, just kind of through looking at what other people have talked about, what other options there might be. And to be honest with you, what, you, what we think might be best for our families and for our students as well. And then turn it away uh, a different direction away from the learning side here, but all of the other things that come with school, like eating lunch in the middle of the day. How are you guys tackling that? So lunch in, in the work we're doing now, which again, I hope to release by August 3rd, uh, lunch might be in the classrooms. So students might get up, leave their desks, go to their lockers, get their lunch or walk down the hall. Um, to the lunchroom, pick up their lunch and bring it back. Or it might even be the case in some of our lower grades where lunch is actually delivered to the classroom so that we can keep students in cohorts together where they're not mingling with every other kid in the building or every other teacher in the building so that if we do end up in a position where we have a, a positive test, it doesn't just shut down the whole building. So lunch is certainly something we've thought a lot about. And I think the best answer is that it may end up being in our classrooms. And then what about even capacity on school buses? Yeah, so um, as, a, as Bishop Elon Catholic Schools, our high school students don't bus. We don't have busing option for our high school kids. Our PK through eight students have the option to bus and that busing is all run through the Sioux City Public School District. So if there will be decisions made on busing, we will just follow those decisions and the guidelines set forth by Sioux City Public Schools. Makes sense. Yeah. And then, um, you, we talked a little bit about this already, but the, the wearing of masks. Say there, there's a kid that needs to go to the bathroom in the middle of like a class, a class period. Are, are you gonna say you have to wear a mask all the way there? Or is that, again, still trying to figure out in, in regards to the whole idea of wearing a mask? I think that for sure that, that hallways will be one of the number one places where we will probably have to utilize masks with our students, whether it's you know, massive amounts of students flowing through the hallways or whether it's just a few students at a time that have to go back to their locker or to the bathroom, as you say. I think because those areas will be traversed by so many different students um, and, and our faculty, that that's, that's sort of necessary. Um, something I'll mention that you haven't asked about, but it just, it just tripped into my brain. You may want to use it at some point in time. And that is that we will be uh, minimizing, if not completely, um, uh, not allowing visitors in our building this next year. So parents in the past who might come and volunteer, they might come read to classes or they might come help with students, student achievements, student testing, those kinds of things. Um, when, when parents come to pick up kids before and after school, drop kids off, pick kids up, um, we're basically going to minimize, if not completely eliminate um, guests in our building this next year to try to help just uh, allow for not necessary foot traffic in our buildings to help keep people safe too, so. No, that's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, uh, more on the side of health here, um, I had a question in, and this is kind of in regards to maybe when students enter the building, mm -hmm. uh, are you guys going to be checking temperatures? Just how will like the health of staff and students be monitored every single day? Sure. So we obviously, we have lots of um, cleaning supplies and cleaning options. Again, we'll have masks, we'll have gloves, we'll have hand sanitizer stations inside of every building and multiple places throughout the building. We, were, we will send students to bathrooms to have hands washed before and after lunch and as many times during the day as, as we need. The temperature taking has been something that the Iowa Department of Education has actually advised against because it can be a false indicator. Some student gets off a hot bus and they've been on that bus for 30 minutes and they come into the building, they, they might read higher than what, um, than what their actual body temperature is. So the Department of Education is advising us against using thermometers and temperature taking. We, are, we have identified in all of our buildings an additional space for students that might be showing symptoms for COVID 
for example, instead of just the nurse's station or the, or the sick room, we've identified a secondary space as well that we can send students to. Obviously, at the high school level, those students will be sent home as quickly as possible. Hopefully, they'll have their own transportation or, or be able to get that, and the younger students the same as well. We will, we will try to clear those students out of the building as quickly as we possibly can. And then with more on the PPE, because you mentioned all that cleaning supplies and hand sanitizer stations, do you feel like you have a sufficient amount of PPE here present at the school? I think the only PPE we don't have a sufficient amount of is Clorox wipes or Lysol wipes, those kinds of um, um, disinfectant wipes. The bottom line is you can't get them anymore. I don't know if you've tried to look online or look in the grocery store, they're just, they're so backed up. So that's the only PPE that we feel like at this point in time. We maybe don't have as much as we'd like, but we do have some electrostatic sprayers, spray bottles that, that spray the, um, the disinfectant and the uh, electrostatic ionizes the, the molecules and that kind of thing and provides for a better cleaning um, of surfaces and that kind of thing. And our students, depending on the classroom, but they will be asked to sort of clean up their space at the end of every day. So not asked to clean up other students' space, but we'll have these spray bottles and a student will be able to pick those spray bottles up and, and uh, uh, spray their desk, spray their work area, take a paper towel and clean that up, which will help us in our efforts to keep the uh, things clean and safe too. Yeah, and hopefully this never happens, but say there is an outbreak at the school. Um, how, how, what, what will be defined here? Like who will be tested? Um, what will the cost be uh, di distributed? Uh, will tests be administered at school? Will they be administered somewhere else? Just what's the, have you broken down that process of if this does happen? So as far as I know, there's, there's no testing at schools. All testing still has to occur through the Siouxland District Health Department, through healthcare providers. There won't be any testing offered on site. Um, at least I haven't heard of any changes to that. As far as what's the process for an outbreak, again, I think we'll follow the Siouxland District Health guidance there. And what that means is they'll come in and they'll do their contact tracing. They will tell us which students and which faculty have been in close enough contact, six feet or less for 15 minutes or more throughout the day. And then we will have to quarantine those students and staff that fit that. Um, and I do believe that much like our baseball and softball teams this year, our softball team had larger exposure, that's why we shut the softball team down. Our baseball team had some exposure, one positive case and some exposure, but they didn't have widespread exposure. So I could envision a school building with several classes still meeting, but some classes being shut down. I could envision an entire building being shut down, but not the entire school system being shut down. Um, I think we will continue to try to forge on um, and not just shut everything down because a, uh, it doesn't make sense to shut down 1,600 students' education because one fourth grader has been tested positive. We will try to look and say what we could do to continue the education going for those students who haven't had exposure and, and haven't tested positive um, and, then, and then remove those students for the, the two-week, 14-day quarantine that have been in that position. And I appreciate you bringing the sports back up because uh, this leads into my next point. What did you and the other staff members learn from that experience that you could apply to the Return to Learn plan? Well, I think, I think Bishop Heelan High School was uh, highly criticized with the closing of the softball season, but the remaining opening of the baseball season. To be fair and to be honest and transparent, I'm not sure that Bishop Heelan High School made that decision. We made that based on the recommendation of the Siouxland District Health. And at first, everyone was very critical of our decisions. But as it progressed on, I've seen several news articles and several editorials and those kinds of things that said maybe Bishop Heelan has actually provided a blueprint for schools and for athletics in the fall. Because to say that two kids on a team have tested positive, we're going to shut the whole season down, doesn't really make sense. Because if there's still 18 kids on that team that haven't been in contact or haven't been in close um, proximity to those kids, why would those 18 kids have to suffer and not participate because these two kids have. So I do think that we learned something through that communication with Siouxland District Health. And I think maybe we've been able to teach a larger audience other than just our own families about that uh, really throughout the state potentially, so. And here's my last one on health for you. If somebody is showing symptoms at school, what's the protocol? Someone is showing symptoms at school, they're immediately sent to that uh, secondary space I alluded to earlier. We have identified in each building 
a second space for students, and then of course, uh, immediate contact of family members and, and send that student home so that they can uh, um, seek advice from their healthcare provider as to what to do next through testing and through other um, processes that the healthcare provider suggests. And then with social distancing, with extracurricular activities like um, choir or band or even PE classes in school, um, how will social distancing be in place for stuff like that? And that could also tie in also to mask wearing because some kids singing or if you have to play the trumpet, you can't really play the trumpet with a mask on. So our band is already meeting. They started last week uh, getting ready for marching band, getting ready for the fall season. And our marching band director is following the guidelines from the Iowa High School Music Association, the IHSMA. And they have the social distancing, when to wear masks, when it's okay to take the masks off how far to keep instruments apart from each other. In particular, I know trombones aren't even six feet apart. They're asking for six to nine feet apart for trombone players because of the size of the instrument and, and the uh, aerosols and the droplets and those kinds of things that might come from playing. So I think the good news is I know the Iowa High School Music Association and the Iowa High School Athletic Association is working on those guidelines and we will just follow those guidelines. We don't, we don't know more than the professionals we want to listen to what they have to say and what they think are the best practices. Um, so in, in regards to teachers, because I, I found this pretty interesting when I was kind of following along with other people's plans, and I don't really think this was really written out, but say a teacher tests positive for COVID-19, and uh, I'm assuming they have to be quarantined for the two week period, but would sick leave be paid? Like, uh, is it unpaid? Would they be teaching online classes from home to their students? or? And then maybe even follow that into substitute teachers. And Correct. with the governor saying that requirements are lowered for substitute teachers, how will you guys be grabbing substitute teachers and telling them that you will be safe in our schools? Yeah, I think if a faculty member tests positive for COVID, you know, we'll have um, some, some obvious concerns there on, on not only the health of that staff member, but on how we deliver that education in that faculty member's absence. Certainly if a faculty member has been exposed but not necessarily diagnosed with COVID, they might return home in quarantine and teach in an online format from their home to the students back in the school. That is, that is certainly a possibility we've considered and we're discussing and probably will come to fruition at some point in time during the season or during the school year. If the faculty member tests positive for COVID, then obviously while that faculty is, member is, is ill and, and unable to teach, in online format, we will have to hire a substitute teacher. We are providing as many mitigation efforts in our classrooms by arranging the desks and arranging everything. We're getting out all unneeded furniture in every classroom so that we can further distance out desks. And to the point I've made a couple times earlier, all of our buildings are different. We have some buildings that have smaller classrooms. We have some buildings that have larger classrooms because when they were built, there were more kids that went into those. I do know that we have very small class sizes in all of our buildings. Our average class size is 17 to 20 students, depending on which grade level and which building you're in. But that's a significant difference from a lot of other Siouxland schools. A lot of other Siouxland schools have 32 kids, 35 kids, 38 kids in a classroom. Well, if you have 34 kids in a classroom, trying to socially distance those kids is a lot different than trying to socially distance maybe 17 or 18 kids. So we'll continue to work through that and make decisions as we as we know how to. And then with substitute teachers, have you seen like maybe an uptick in more people wanting to do it? Have you seen more people concerned about coming like from all different places? Sure. And are you concerned if somebody were to come from a different school district, say, here to substitute teach? We have a hard time finding substitute teachers as it is. I know the governor's proclamation might help us in that. And to be honest with you, in the short period of time since that's occurred, we don't have any more information as to whether or not there might be more substitutes out there for us to consider. We will continue to search and to try to certainly have a lengthy list of substitutes before the school year even starts. I don't think we have any concern over a substitute coming in and having been in another building. I think we all know that um, as, as um, Americans, as Iowans, as, as human beings, if everyone does what they're supposed to do during this pandemic, the pandemic will be a shorter period of time. Um, if, if students and, and families and faculty and substitutes aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then I suppose we probably have a lot more to worry about. 
those students that may say they don't want to be in school or their parents say like I just really don't feel comfortable here uh, a lot of training must go into um, the technology then and, and do you, I don't know if you guys provide laptops to students I, I don't know if with this pandemic if you will start sure. uh, giving laptops to students but what type of training and what type of accessibility will students have working from home so um, this spring we had a significant number of computer um, computers that we could uh, give to students to take home to utilize we've actually spent a significant portion of some cares act funding we received from the government this year this summer to buy additional devices in preparation for what's coming obviously in the spring the governor with the limited information she had, obviously did not give us a tremendous amount of time to transition from no school on site to virtual learning. So we, we do have lots of professional development lined up. Excuse me, we do have lots of professional development lined up for our teachers um, here in late July and in early August. Um, some of that is actually through the Diocese of Sioux City and some of that is through the professional development we're organizing here at Bishop Healand Catholic Schools in an attempt to streamline what our teachers do. We've also, and our families um, receive, we've also identified only two learning platforms that will be used in an online learning scenario. All of our third grade through 12th grade students and staff will use what's called Google Classroom. And that is where they will check in and check out and where all the materials will be posted. So families will only have one password, you know, maybe multiple passwords if they have multiple children, but they only have one password to get into that. And then for our PK through second grade, we'll be using an app, uh, a platform called Seesaw. And so again, all parents will know exactly where to go. We're not going to allow multiple you know, platforms, depending on what grade, what building, what, all, what subject. We're just sticking with those two platforms, and we think that will help our families, our students, and our faculty. And how will you make sure no student kind of gets left behind in that process? So obviously, we are not a one-to-one -one school. We, with the purchase of the new um, computers we've done this summer, we will be close to that. A lot of our families do have uh, devices at home. What we did this spring and what we will do this fall is we will have the opportunity for students to check those computers out, knowing that a, a family of four students at home might not need four laptops. They might need three laptops, and, and we'll help them get to those numbers that they need at home to ensure that they have access to what they need. And John, I know I've been taking up a ton of your time. It's good. I just want to make sure that we don't have to come back to you and have For to do sure. this all again. Um, I, I, oh, okay, so here's one that I wrote up here uh, about a COVID-19 liability waiver. Are you making students or, or parents sign those? Uh, so some school districts are having those liability waivers being signed that if, you know, releasing you guys from fault of a COVID-19 um, Sure. Damage happens, for, for lack of a better term. So, uh, uh, how will you, will you be doing that, or how will you be working around that? We've not made the determination whether we'll do the the COVID nineteen waiver of liability or not yet. We'll be making that decision hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And then you said August third. Is that kind of like the date that the final return to learn plan will? Be That's our intended date of our mitigation plans. Yeah, and how we're going to make that look. Again, that buys us a couple more weeks just to see what the environment is like, and full well knowing that anything could change even between August 3rd and August 24th when students come back or, or could change by the end of that first week. We're very well aware of that. It would be a very malleable situation. It's okay. And then I have two more for you, John. Sure. Um, just um, with curriculum for teachers trying to meet that criteria of how much they can cover or how much they're supposed to cover throughout a school year with reduced maybe classroom hours, how are they expected to kind of fit everything during this weird time? For sure. I, I have every confidence in our faculty and our staff. We have outstanding teachers. I know that they will prioritize the subjects and the topics that need to be prioritized in order to progress our students along at the pacing and at the skill level that, that we need to see happen. Obviously, if there's a massive shutdown for several months, that's going to be more challenging than if there's some pockets of time when we have to move to hybrid or when we have to move to online learning, but I have complete confidence in our faculty and our staff to make that happen. And then John, is there anything that I haven't asked you? Uh, is there anything with re in regards to maybe stuff that are still going on this summer for the past seniors? Is, is there anything that's in leading into this year that I'm forgetting to ask you? I know we covered a lot of information, but can you think of anything? We did. Um, I don't, 
I don't think so. I think uh, maybe the one, one thing I might just add is that I think all administrators over the summer this year have in particular put in lots and lots of hours and time and energy and stress to try to help make the upcoming school year a success for all of our faculty and our staff and our students. I certainly know that our faculty um, will be great beneficiaries of the work that our administrators have done, full well knowing that um, this summer has been unlike any other summer that we've, we've experienced when it comes to planning for the fall. And um, I just, I know that not just bragging on our own administration, but I can only imagine that all administrators from uh, all across the country have done a tremendous job of doing what they think is best with the information that we have, knowing that none of us have lived through anything like this. So I, I know that I appreciate our families and, and I'm sure my counterparts appreciate the families of all in our community who are being patient and understanding that everybody's doing the best we can with the information that we've been given.